Bibles, if you turn your Bibles to the book of Matthew, you can also call the court of Matthew chapter 4, it is our lecture text, gospel lecture text for this morning. Matthew chapter 4, as we begin to delve into this blatant series around intimacy, and we take a look at how to be intimate with ourselves. So if you have your Bibles to the church, it's on page 785, or you can look on the screen for the new revised standard version of the Bible. And it reads as follows. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterward he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, again, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him and suddenly angels came and waited on him. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. And we said thanks be to God. So we spent some time in this text um, about a year ago, but today we're going to talk about what do I hunger for? What do I hunger for? Let's stop the word. God, we acknowledge that you know more than us, and you see more than us, and you are wiser than us. Therefore, God, when you speak, we need to listen. And so, God, we ask that you would tune our hearts, our minds, our ears to the sound of your voice in this moment, that we may hear you, that we may receive what you have for us, and that it may take root and grow, and that we might be changed by it. God, be in use of your people, and as you speak to us, God, may it empower us to do what you ask us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'll tell you a poem of a silly young king who played with the world at the end of the street. And he only loved one single thing, and that was a peanut butter sandwich. His scepter and his royal gowns, his regal throne, and his golden crowns were all brown and sticky from the mounds of each and every peanut butter sandwich. His subjects were all royal fools as he had passed a royal rule that all that they could learn of school was how to make a peanut butter sandwich. He would not eat his sub sovereign steak. He scorned his soup and keenly came. And he ordered the court and king to make, cook to make, an extra sticky peanut butter sandwich. And then one day he took a bite and he started chewing mm, with delight, but found his mouth was stuck quite tight from that last bite of a peanut butter sandwich. His brother pulled, his sister cried, the phone came, and the guard pushed, and his mother cried, a boy has committed suicide from eating his last peanut butter sandwich. The dentist came, and the royal doc, and the plumber came, he banged and knocked, but still they could not break through that peanut butter sandwich. The carpenter, he tried with pliers, the um, telephone man tried with wires and the fireman, he tried with fire, but nothing would melt that peanut butter sandwich. All the royal subjects came and they hooked his jaws with grappling chains and they pulled both ways with might and main, but nothing would budge that stubborn peanut butter sandwich. So every man, every woman, every girl, and every boy put down the clouds, their pots, their toys. And they came and they pulled and they pulled until, oh joy, they broke right through that peanut butter sandwich with a puff of dust, a screech, and a squeak. 
his jaws open with a creak, and in a voice so faint and weak, the first words he said were, how about a <laughs> The Lenten season is about giving up something that's pleasurable in our life in order to make space, in order to make room for self-examination, for repentance, and for reconnection with God. It is the place and the time where we become intimate. We take a self-examination, we dig deep, and we say, God, come with us and dig deep within us. We invite God to show us our blind spots. We invite God to show us what we are truly hungry for. Now, I would contest that all of us have at least one relationship that's similar to the relationship between the king and his peanut butter sandwich. And if we aren't able to name where that relationship is in our life, it's because we are either blind to it or in denial of it. But this is what this time is about. This time is about learning how to see where we are hungry for things and how we are feeling that hunger for that need in our life. What are we doing? How are we seeking to feel these things that we feel so deep within us? Well, I believe that the wilderness has caught a really bad rap. <laughs> I believe that it is not a place that is to be avoided at all costs. I do not believe the wilderness is evil, despite, you know, contrary belief, right? right? Um, but I believe that the wilderness is a place where we grow and where we expand. When we think about the wilderness, we think about famine, we think about lack, right? We think about struggle. And oftentimes it is associated with some of the lowest points of our life. Mm -hmm. And yet, and in the opening of this text today, Matthew chapter 4 says that the Spirit of God led Jesus up mm -hmm. into the wilderness, mm -hmm. not down. Mm -hmm. You see, I would contend that the hardest part of the wilderness isn't the wilderness experience itself, it's our resistance to it. Yeah. You know, kind of like yeah. that moment where you see you're going to fall and so you tense up and it ends up causing you more injury than if you would just fail, <laughs> right? It is our resistance to the wilderness that causes us more pain and more struggle, not the wilderness in and of itself. Jesus has been fasting 40 days and 40 nights. When the tempter, Satan, comes to him and he says to him, if you are the Son of God, turn these stones into great. Now Jesus is famished. Yes, he's physically hungry, but Jesus' response to Satan is, it is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Right. Satan says, okay, you want to play the it is written game. Let's, let's play the game. <laughs> right? So he changes up his game. And I don't know what happened. I don't know how they went to another place. I don't know whether it was an actual spatial movement or a vision, but for Jesus, it was real. So he takes him up to the holy place on top of a temple, and he says, throw yourself down. Hear me, Jesus. It is written. Right? right? That God will give command or charge of his angels over you so that they will bear you up on their arms and their hands, and you will not dash your foot against the stone. Yeah, Jesus says, all right, I'll be on the it is also written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Say, sensing that his tactics aren't working, takes him to yet another place, high on a mountain, and he shows him all the kingdoms of the world and all their splendor. Now, I'm convinced at this moment that Satan knew he had failed. He knew he wasn't going to succeed. And I was just, I'm just wondering if he was just trying to be funny with his last temptation. I mean, he's talking to Jesus, the fully human, Fully divine Savior, right? Who in his fully divine space was present at the beginning of creation. All right? And he is saying to him, he says, okay, he says, I will give you all of this if you bow down and worship me. And I don't know if he was trying to make Jesus angry or not, but Jesus was definitely a noble. Because Jesus says, oh, away with you, Satan, I'm tired of you. It is written that you are to worship the Lord your God and serve only Him. Yes. And so Satan goes away and the angels come to attend to Jesus. 
Now, I believe that Satan made several mistakes in his temptation of Jesus, but the most important mistake, or the greatest mistake that he made, was waiting until after Jesus had fasted 40 days and 40 nights to come and try and tempt him. Right. right? The misconception that, that Satan made was that, that he would be so hungry, that his superficial physical hunger would be so great that it would um, cloud his judgment and his ability to make the right decision. Right? But the truth of the matter is that fasting as a discipline is designed to give us a spiritual and mental acuity that makes us clearer than when we enter the wilderness. Right. I would propose that Jesus was not in his most vulnerable state after 40 days and 40 nights of fasting. Mm, yeah. Satan got it wrong. Right. He approached him at the wrong time. Maybe he should have him midway through. Right? He was struggling with stuff. But he was at his greatest point at the end of the fast. Jesus had come in. He had already faced his fears. He had already faced the things that he needed, his hungers. He had already allowed God the Father to show him how to meet these hungers that were within him. He was in a place where he was saying, okay, I got it. And yet here he comes. Thomas Ryan, in the Sacred Art of Fasting, says this. Oh, come up. One of the special benefits of fasting is that it provides us with an opportunity to listen to what comes up within us, to fears that are generally repressed. This kind of deep inner listening is in part what fasting as a spiritual practice is all about. Fasting, lit, is about getting deep about seeing ourselves. Jesus had done this in the wilderness. He had faced, yes, his fears as you. He had faced all of these things. And I want to spend just a few more minutes talking about the three hungers that I believe Satan was tempting Jesus with, or trying to create temptation around with Jesus. Not realizing that Jesus was already aware of them and had already knew how they were to be. We're going to talk about these three hungers because they are hungers that all human beings have. Mm. All right? So the first temptation was about the hunger for security. It was about the hunger for security. Satan says to Jesus, he says, if you are the son of God, turn these stones to bread. Now, yes, of course, Jesus was hungry and he was enticing him to create food, right? And yes, of course, he was saying, if you are the son of God, he was, had this claim in the identity of who God and Christ was. However, if we dig a little deeper, we see that he's also making another claim. He's saying to Jesus that this is what you need, and I want you to create what you need. Something that only God can do for us. What is security? Security is the guarantee that our basic needs will be met. Right? Yeah. But the truth of the matter is, it is an illusion for us to believe that we provide our own security. We just don't. Right? And so Satan is saying to Jesus, create your own security. Make your own food. Provide for yourself. Now don't get me wrong. If you are out of work, don't be looking for a job. Talk about yourself. God is so poor money forever. God often uses, right, work as a means of providing for us. Don't stop praying for provision. Right? right? But what I am saying is that for those of us who make all the right financial decisions, who have all the money in the bank, things can change overnight. We can lose our job, our bank accounts will dwindle, and our houses can go into foreclosure just like that. Why? Because the reality of the matter is that there is no long standing security in part of God. So yes, we still make good financial choices. We are still good um, stewards over what God has given us. But we have to keep in mind that God is our security. Yeah. What we have is because God has provided us. Yeah. 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 And yet, as humans, we have a desire and a hunger to feel secure. To know that what we need is going to be there when we need it. And I would contend that that is a hunger that God has given to us. The question is, how have we been seeking to fill it apart from God? Right? And I would say this. I would say that when we have a hunger for security and we are not aware of it, we often lead ourselves into places of worry and anxiety and anxiousness. And if we're not careful, our false sense of self-security, of security for ourselves, 
will allow us to yield to fear in a way that makes us disobedient mm, right. and it leads us away from the purpose God has for us. Right. I have an associate of mine who um, tells a part of her story and she says, you know, I was working at this institution, you know, it was steady pay, it was good pay, but it was all around. You know, um, I really felt like God was pressing me to apply for this position at another organization. She says, well, when I went and looked at the um, job description for this other job, it was grant funding, which means that it may not be renewed from year to year. It could be just a temporary position. And she says, I did. I just said that I needed to apply for it. She says, but I just couldn't. And I think her fear was reasonable, you know, insofar as why would I leave a permanent position for something that may be temporary? But despite the prompting that she feels like she had inside of her, she stayed where she was, only to find out that six months later she was laid off from her job and was out of work for a whole year. Our false sense of self-security will make us yield to fears that create in us the ability to be disobedient and it turns us away from our purpose. We have a hunger for security. Jesus had a hunger for security, but after spending time in the wilderness, after facing this hunger and these fears within him, Jesus realized that if I had waited 40 days and 40 nights without eating food, I could wait a few more minutes for God to provide for me yeah. and I can get everything I need. Yeah. That thing puts stuff into perspective. These intimate moments places things in the proper perspective. That's why we need these moments. Right. Temptation number two was about the hunger for love. Temptation number two was about the hunger for love. Satan says to Jesus, he says, you know, we're on top of this temple. He says, I want you to jump. He says, I want you to jump because God's word says that he will come and rescue you. What was he saying? He was saying to Jesus, I want you to prove that the God that you say loves you, loves you enough to come and save you. He was saying, I want you to prove that you are lovable enough. That you can be loved. Right? Now, this is important with us because we spend a whole lot of time and do a whole lot of behaviors trying to prove that we are loved. Right? Trying to feel this hunger and this need for, for, for love. See, love is connected to our sense of self worth and value. Right? And so we constantly are on this, this path of, and it cannot be loved. Do people love me? You know? Am I worthy of this love? Now, I know our favorite movie right now is Frozen. Yeah. Uh, I was excited about that the first time I saw it. I did like 15 or 20 and said, like, I know about all right. I didn't know. I know all the words. Here we go. I'm like, baby, just say But the premise of the movie is that there are two sisters who are princesses in this kingdom, and the oldest sister, Elsa, has special powers. And her parents decide that it's safer for her youngest sister, Anna, not to know that she has these powers, as well as the entire kingdom. But as a result, Anna, who is the younger sister, feels isolated and unloved by her sister and many of the other people in the kingdom. So, when their parents die, Elsa now has to open the gates for her coronation because she's becoming queen. And Anna is so excited because she's going to be around people and she has all these dreams of finding her true love, right? Now, Anna's need for love actually made her vulnerable to this thought and this idea that she could just marry the first man that she met, and she does that. She decides to marry the first man that she meets after only meeting him for a couple of hours, <laughs> right? Elsa says to her, what do you know about true love? You don't know anything about true love. She says, I don't care. I'm going to marry him. This is love. <laughs> right? Only to discover later that yes, his, his intentions were not honorable and his character was really shaped. Right? But this is not the trap that we walk into. This hunger for love. This hunger for God to love us. This love that we already have but cannot accept. Mm. Makes us do things that we normally just would not do seeking to feel a hunger that God has already given. <laughs> We walk into relationships, right? We develop habits. We expose ourselves. We become vulnerable in ways that we should not simply because we cannot accept the offering that God has already given. Jesus spent 40 days 
intimately looking at his hunger and his desire for love, God's acceptance of him. And he needed this. You see, this was the time in between the fact that Jesus was affirmed, his baptism, and then he goes into the wilderness, and then he launches his actual, like, official ministry, right? So this is that space in between. Those places where we're, you know, quiet and struggling a little bit. We're not quite sure. Right? If God is going to show up. And people can love us. But it's in that space that if we press through, we can come to see that, yes, I do have a hunger for love. And that hunger is there because this is what I was created for. And that hunger is already filled by the God who created me. You gotta spend those intimate moments though to come to that realization because it's easy to say but much harder to do. Temptation number three, finally, was about the hunger for power. Power here means the ability to act or the capacity to accomplish something. The ability to act or the capacity to accomplish something. Now we often have a misconception about our hunger for power. Right? Which is really about, can we accomplish what God has purposed us to do? Right? Feeling as if we have that capacity. But we miss, uh, conceive that, and we get it all convoluted in our head with our need, our, our um, choices of trying to fill this hunger by feeling like we need to have command or power over other people. Right? Control over other people. Two different kinds of power. Right? Our hunger is about fulfilling what God called us to do. Right. But we try to fill it by lording ourselves over other people. Right. right? And that's what this last temptation was about, showing Jesus all these kingdoms. But the truth of the matter is, if we look at the life of Jesus, Jesus never used his power in terms of control over others. Mm. Even with his disciples, he would give them commandments, but he never demanded that they obey. Right. And at no point did he even use his power to change the course of his future. Right? We look at Luke 22, the evening before the death of Jesus. He goes and he's praying to God the Father. He says, if you are willing, take this cup yeah. from me. And yet, the next day, he still drank from that same cup of death. And he died not just out of love for us, but he died out of submission to the Father. And because it was his purpose for being here. He lived into his power, his capacity to accomplish what he was supposed to accomplish. And he had not, not had that moment in that wilderness where he faced his human fears, where he faced the hungers that were deep within him. I'm not sure it would have been asleep. We need these moments, right? In the midst of this broken world, these moments where in the midst of trauma and abusive relationships, we, are, we start to feel as if we don't have the capacity to do what we should do. We feel as if we're not good enough, or not powerful enough, or not um, gifted enough to complete these tasks. And so we usually respond to that in one of two ways. Either we go too far to the left and we say, well, I'm going to get my power back by bullying other people, by being mean and nasty. Or we go too far to the right and we say, well, you know what? This has been taken from me and there's nothing I can do to get it back. I'm just going to be powerless and helpless. Right? I'm going to exist in this perpetual state of being a victim. Mm. Now, when I was growing up, even now, I mean, I've always struggled with my family. Right? And I know I got on my, my family's ass early. Right? With <laughs> my way. Didn't want to go shopping. It was crazy. But... What I realized is that I had been told this story when I was growing up that when I was born, the doctor came to my mom and he said to her, he says, I hope you got a cow because we have been trying to put your baby on a feeding schedule. But every time she is hungry in between, she will not take water. She only wants milk. Right? And so unconsciously, I had developed this kind of pattern in my head that this was genetic, this was not something I could control, that my weight was just what it was. My appetite was just how it was, right? And I was powerless to do anything about it. But it was during one Lenten season of fasting, because my mom has always practiced um, Lent, right? Or participating in Lent. It was during one of those seasons that God kind of revealed to me and showed to me that despite the genetics of my body that I have no control over, I have always had the power or the capacity to make healthy decisions for my life. Right. That has never changed. 
And just knowing that I had the ability, just knowing that I had the capacity, gave me what I needed to make the different decisions. Power is not about how great people see you. It's not about how much money you have. It's not about whether or not you can overpower somebody else. It's not about whether or not you can manipulate others to do what you want them to do. It's not about whether or not you can make your child succeed. Power is about whether or not you have the capacity, and you know you have the capacity, to fulfill the purpose by his hand. It is a hunger in you. It is a hunger that you will only be able to feel in connection with God. Only be able to feel if you can look intimately enough in the mirror to say, how have I been trying to feel this without God? Amen. All three of these hungers are hungers that we all have as humans. But we have other hungers as well. And that becomes a question for today. What am I hungry for? And how have I been feeling these hungers apart from God? Psychologist John Allen says that self-awareness can be excruciatingly painful. That's why this Lenten season is associated with ash. Dust. Right? From the dust we come, and from the dust we shall return. We are all needing to be in a repentant stage. We are all needing to be in a humble place for God to show us and then reveal us. That is why I suggest that we don't do this kind of work outside of fasting and praying. You need to fast to do this kind of work. Trust me. You need God close. We all need God close to this kind of work. But I will also suggest that even though this is a self-examination that is very personal, you're going to be spending most of your week and you spend most of your time alone in your own thoughts and in your own prayers. Take at least one to two hours a week. Go to a live group. There is something powerful about knowing that other people are really concerned and struggling with the same things that you are. Yes. There is power in that. Don't do it completely alone. Even Jesus had angels to come and attend to him in the wilderness. Now, if you don't need something that Jesus needed, you know, go ahead. <laughs> but I want what Jesus had. And at the very least, I might even move up. <laughs> right? Right. But we got to do this. Why? Because this was a pivotal moment in the life of our fully human, fully divine Savior. It was pivotal because it was that pivotal moment where he went into ministry having faced all the things that were within him. And he was able to acknowledge them and know how they needed to be. This is about your purpose. This is about where God is taking you. So this is our challenge. Reflection questions for the week. Am I uncomfortable with silence for my own thoughts? If so, why? What am I hungry for? And how am I going to respond to my hunger? You don't have to write all these down right now. They're going to come back up in the service <coughs> so you see them because I want us to make sure we're taking this moment to just sit with what we have heard, what has been received. So why don't you just stand on your feet? Grab your hand with the person next to you. Oh. 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 So my first request is that you just be completely present with yourself. And what that means is that I want you to just be honest about what you're thinking and what you're feeling right now. No matter what that is, it may be that, you know, you're indifferent. It may be that you're annoyed. It may be that you're tired. It may be that you're excited. It may be that you're just processing. Whatever it is, just acknowledge it as an honest emotion and feeling. We want to go before God in this moment vulnerable, and that means being honest. Now I want you to acknowledge that God is present. And I don't know where you are in your walk. Even the people that I know or feel like I know very well, it's often true that we don't know people's private lives. So I don't know where you are. I don't know what your relationship is like with God. I don't know where you are specifically this morning. 
But I am asking you that no matter where you are, whether you believe or don't believe, whether you doubt or don't doubt, I just I'm asking for just these next few moments that you take home and give God the benefit of the doubt. Say, God, I'm gonna believe for just a moment that you are my God, that you created me, and you want what's best for me. That's all I'm asking you to do is just believe for just a minute that God wants what is best for you. The God who has always existed. There was never a time when God was not. The God who has all wisdom and who has all sovereign power. That God in this moment wants what's best for you. The third thing is I want you to acknowledge that you're holding someone's hand. You may not know their entire story, but they are a person who comes with experiences, who comes with their own joys and their own pains. And though they are walking their own path of life right now, you are connected both physically and spiritually. This is your brother or your sister. Whether you know their name or whether you don't know their name, you are connected to a community right here, right now, and that is not our focus. So you're honestly where you are. You're believing that God wants what's best for you, and you are connected to someone else. And we're going to believe together as we pray to God. God, we have all kinds of stuff in us. God, we got all kinds of fears that have been repressed. God, we got all kinds of behaviors that are really manifestations of us trying to fix things in our life. God, we got all these areas and places of confusion and blindness and denial. But God, even in the midst of that, we also have moments and places of joy and excitement. We have places of hope, God. We have places and moments, God, where we dream beyond measure. And so, God, we're asking that you take us exactly as we are right now. Not who we've been and not who we will be, but God, right now, allow us to be present with you as who we are. And God, we say that as we are entering into this Lenten season, God, that we cannot do this without you. God, if we've never fasted before, God, we're praying now that you give us the courage to say no to something so that we can say yes to you. God, we pray that you give us the courage to put something aside in order to make room for you to free us. God, if we have never prayed on a regular basis, God, I pray that the Spirit will prompt us every day in our hearts and in our minds, God, that we will be convicted that we will just have to stop and say, God, I at least acknowledge you today. God, I pray that today is the day that marks a change in each and every one of our lives. God, that we will not leave this place the way that we came in. God, that something will change, God. Something will shift within us, God. We will hear your voice differently. We will hear you more keenly, God. We will be more determined to be who you ask us to be. Now, God, we know that we are facing the wilderness. And God, we are saying right now that if there's any resistance in us, any resistance in our mind or in our body or in our spirit, God, that you will begin to just loosen that, that tension that we are trying to hold and resist against these places, God, where you want to take us to show us our true selves. God, we pray right now that where our fist is balled up, God, that you begin to just open up our head, God. But I pray that where our hearts are hardened and cold, God, that you begin to just warm and get your love, Almighty God. But where we have been closed towards other people, God, and not realizing that we are closed towards you, God, begin to just knock on that door and show us that that door has been closed to you, God. But I thank you in Jesus' name that we can take this step by step. But God, that we don't have to cover our pain anymore, God. So Lord, begin to show us the ways in which we use food and the ways in which we use alcohol and the ways in which we use shopping and the ways in which we use television and pornography and all these different things, Almighty God, to feel the hopes and the needs that you place within us for good purpose, God. Lord, and show us, God, that you are the ones who feel it. Because, God, we can say it every day, but it's harder to live it. It's harder to embody it. It's harder to walk in it, God. So, Lord, we pray now that you make the ground that we walk on hollow ground, that your spirit will be infused within us, God. Lord, that when we walk through the valleys of the shadow of death, Almighty God, that we will have no fear of evil. But God, you are with us. Your rod and your staff protects us. So God, whatever it is we got inside of us, God, whatever's going on in our relationships, in our hands, in our families, in our private lives, in our public lives, God, whatever that thing is, God, however we see ourselves that is not 
um, good and where it is destructive to voice us. God, I just pray that in your wisdom and in your power and in your sovereignty, God, that you reach out and you touch those most vulnerable places, that you touch those sore places, God, and you begin to heal us by the power of your son, Jesus. God, we pray for healing in Jesus' name. We pray, God, for change. We pray, God, for an open heart and a God, we pray for clarity. And God, we thank you that we will come out of this not more humble, but stronger. God, we will not be weakened to the point where we cannot resist temptation. But God, this is a process that will allow us to resist it when we've never been able to resist it. So God, take all of us from here and resolve in our hearts that there is change coming to us. It's all in our hearts that we will be able to fulfill the purpose you have given to us. We pray and believe these things in Jesus' name. Amen.